seated. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by light of the Holy Spirit, granted by the same Spirit, may be truly wise, never rejoice in his consolation to the same Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lady Fatima, St. Joseph, Paul and Terry, St. John Bosco, St. John Vianney, St. Alphonsus, uh, St. Padre Pio. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Good evening. Good evening, Father. Uh, my parents were open to having a big family. My parents were married uh, June 26, 1954. Uh, my older brother was born March 27th, 1955, nine months and one day after my parents were married. <laughs> Do you know what an Irish twin is? Yes. Well, I'm an Irish twin. Irish twin means that you're born within the year of one of your siblings. So every year, once we hit the end of February, by the way, I'm I'm 15 celebrating my quinceanera. <laughs> I do it for four years because I was born on leap year, no? Oh. So every year, once we hit February 29th, I'm the same age as my older brother. How about that? <laughs> so my parents had uh, very quickly had had a boy and then a boy and then another boy, another boy. And finally, they had a girl, and her name is Victoria. Yeah. <laughs> Victoria Ann. So a little anecdote from the, li uh, from, the, from the life of my little sister. If you have any teenage children, or maybe you, w you were a teenager once, um, teenagers have a tendency to become rebellious. So my sister... Uh, Vicky, when she was a teenager, decided I don't want to go to confession anymore. Uh, but my mom's a real trooper. When she wants something, she gets it done, usually through a lot of prayer and penance and intelligence and insistence. So a long time passed, five months, six months, seven months, about eight months passed, and my sister would not go to confession. But my mom was praying. So one day my sister comes up to my mom and says, I will go to confession. But under one condition, I'm not going to go face to face because the pastor was a good friend. <laughs> Father Goff was his name. He was a good friend of the family. And uh, my sister said, I don't want to go. I don't want him to see me. So mom said, you can go behind the screen if you like. Some people prefer face-to-face. -face, others prefer the anonymous behind the screen. My sister says, I want to go anonymous. I want to go behind the screen. The mom said, great, do it. So the fatal day arrives. And my sister goes behind the screen like this and says, bless me, Father, for I've sinned. My last confession was eight months ago. And Father Goff did this. Oh, hi, Vicky. <laughs> so from that moment on, my sister had no problems in going to confession. And uh, it sometimes is the devil that puts up roadblocks so that we don't carry out uh, the noble proposals and e enterprise that God inspires us to carry out. So that's kind of a long-winded introduction to the topic tonight. Today we're going to be talking about confession. <clears throat> I'm be talking about uh, making a general confession. When they say the word general, that does not mean generic, abstruse, or abstract, or esoteric. Or rather, general means a confession of your whole life. 
confession of your whole life. So let's go to the reasons why this should be done and then how it's to be done. And then we'll talk about, we'll conclude by talking about the wonderful fruits or benefits of making a general confession. Okay, reasons why we should make a general confession. First reason is St. Ignatius says we should do it. That's enough for me. He's a kind of nice saint. I'm not. And I told you four weeks ago when I was giving you a thumbnail summary of the life of Ignatius that he went through various stages of conversion, but the big conversion came through his general confession in Montserrat. Remember? When he made that general confession, it took uh, in between four and five days for him to make the general confession. Doesn't mean you're going to take four to five days to make the general confession. You'll be sending the priest to the cemetery, okay? <laughs> but you want to really, in imitation of Ignatius, you want to prepare yourself well. Okay, the second reason why is um, over the past 50 years, there's really been a crisis in catechesis. Uh, the younger generation wouldn't understand that, but we were born uh, in the time of the Baltimore Catechism. We remember that the catechesis were very solid. I was born at the tail end of that, so me and my older brother got the tail end of the Baltimore. Then, basically, catechesis became feelings. Okay? It became basically feelings. When you had in the 70s the balloons, the banners, and the bozo masses, remember that? Okay. Everything became feelings. And there was the, 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 the way to make a good confession was not taught in many places for a couple of generations. So it might be, it might be such that you, you, you've never really made a really good confession in your whole life. So now is the opportunity. The third reason is this. There are certain uh, sins that cause a lot of embarrassment. A lot of embarrassment. And it might be such that because of that, uh, we're paralyzed through fear and we don't get those sins out. You know, there's a lot of sins that are kind of embarrassing. Maybe a homosexual act, maybe the masturbation, maybe adultery. It can be, especially though, against the Sixth and Ninth Commandment, they're pretty embarrassing. And we might be filled with shame and fear. I'm not going to, I'll get all these out, but that one I'm, gonna t I'm not going to tell Father. Uh-uh. That's, uh, that's a bad confession. You've got to tell the truth. Otherwise, the confession is going to be incomplete. So that's another reason. Okay, another reason is making a good confession is going to help you to grow in humility. We all need humility, right? Yep. As well as it helps us to grow in self-knowledge. As the poet says, the man, man is a mystery unto himself. We don't really know ourselves. No? We're an enigma, an enigma. We all have blind spots, maybe a lot of them. Okay, but I'd, I'd like to talk about one of the most important reasons why a gender confession should be made. Uh, by means of a, of a scenario or a life circumstance that many of us have experienced. Okay, when people get married, and married in the church, what are they thinking about the month before they get married? Be honest. They're, they're thinking about the party, right? They're thinking about the guests that are coming in from Guadalajara. Okay? 
Um, uh, the bride is thinking about um, how long the the veil is going to be. Is it going to be eight inches or twelve inches? These transcendental important things that have to be resolved, right? And of course, you know, is it going to be carrot cake with chocolate sprinkles on top of it? These very very important topics that have to be debated and resolved, right? And then who's going to pick up Uncle Willie at the airport? So all these social, social things have to be resolved. But maybe before you got married, maybe you committed some mortal sins. Maybe you had premarital sex. Maybe you missed mass on purpose. Maybe you got high on drugs. Maybe you looked at pornography, committed impure acts. These are all, they're called mortal sins. So what happens is you commit one of these mortal sins, and maybe many, and because of all these social um, activities that have to be resolved, you never make it to confession before you get married. So what does that mean is going to happen the day of your wedding if you have a nuptial mass? There is a, it, it's, a, it's a double sacrilege. It's a double sacrilege. When I say double, is that you received communion in mortal sin. And you received the sacrament of matrimony in mortal sin on the day that you were married. What a way to start out your married life. No? So from that moment on, you get married, you're never at peace. You're always fighting and bickering with your husband or your wife. You always see the negative in him. First child is born, you're fighting even more and more. The second one is born, I mean, you're almost, it's almost insupportable. And then after eight years, you throw in the towel and say, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. You know why? You never received the sacramental grace of marriage. You follow me? Yep. Now, you've never heard this preached by anyone except Father Broom. A book should be written on this. Because I believe this is one of the primary reasons why many Catholic marriages end up on the rocks and terminate in divorce. For that reason, anyone who comes to this parish, I've created a lot of the programs because I've been here for many years. I'm known as the tough priest, the tough guy. No? as all the programs that I set up are among the most demanding in LA. This is the most difficult program you've ever gone through in your life. Right? right. Probably is. Yes. You know, meditating an hour a day for 70 days, you never had to do something like this before. I mean, if you collaborate with it, it's hard. But it pays off. Right? It's hard work. And I... I do it out of love for you people. Why should I be promoting mediocrity? No. I've always m believed, being, being an athlete most of my life, don't lower the bar, raise the bar, raise it. Raise the bar. Why should I, I conform myself to promoting you people to be lukewarm, mediocre, half-faith ca Catholics? That's, that's, I think that's an insult to your dignity as a Catholic. I do. So you come, in to get, you come in here to prepare for marriage in this parish. <laughs> you don't know what you're getting involved in. <laughs> and I'm somewhat evasive in the way that I put down the conditions. No? You're going to be coming to a, a, a one-hour talk with, with mentors every week for a year. You've got 50 classes, not to mention NFP and the, um, and the retreat. 
Now, people come in and they say, that's too much. I will defend myself. I say, look, I'm a priest. You know how many years I studied before becoming a priest? 11 years. I, I started until I was 30 years old. That's a long haul. And I'm not complaining. I'm thankful that I had... You know, I had, a, I had my, my bachelor's from Villanova, then I got my degree in philosophy and theology from Rome at the Angelicum. I'm not complaining, uh, but it was a lot of studies, a long haul. Now, if it took me 11 years to be a priest, you can't say one year to be prepared to get married is too much. We have a word in, we have a, an expression in New York, that's a lot of baloney okay? <laughs> or malarkey. Huh? We have another one from New York, hogwash. Huh? So, that was maybe a, a side mark, but uh, important. So it might be that you know you you got married with that condition. You did not make a good confession before you're married, and consequently, you're really not at peace. So how good, is, how good God is that he sent you to, to this course? Say, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I mean, you really show, well, not me. Thank you, God, right? <laughs> no, don't thank me. I, I'm sorry. Thank you, God, okay? <laughs> we should be grateful that we're here. Really grateful. And I think I know, I, I really believe that you know in the depths of your heart that you know, what I'm saying is the truth. It resonates as the truth, even though it's kind of painful and hard to hear that. And this will serve, because a lot of you have children, that will be confirmed. You know, before confirmation is the same principle. Or, or say, for example, I'm ordained in the priesthood, and the night before, I get high on drugs and I get drunk, and, they, and I'm confirmed in that state, I would re have received uh, holy orders in the state of mortal sin. That didn't happen, but I'm speaking theoretically, <laughs> no? But I would have to go to confession before. So what happens if you go to confession, and this is a scenario, you're married for 12 years, after you receive absolution, then the sacramental grace of matrimony descends upon you after 12 years. Praise the Lord. Amen. You haven't had it until you finish that confession. So, so confession, you know, as Catholics, the Catholic Church is a sacramental church. We're sanctified through the sacraments. But you have to receive the sacraments well. Scott Hahn, in one of his talks, said, the sacraments are like fire. They can either warm us or burn us. No? Fire can either warm you or burn you. I remember when I was about 11 years old, I, um, me and my older brother, I was about 10 or 11, we decided we are going to sleep out that night because we are Boy Scouts and trying to tough up and so it was, a, it was the middle of November, a really cold night. So my older brother had a, he had a sleeping bag. I didn't have one. So I asked one of my best friends to lend me a sleeping bag. So we had a fire, and it was really getting cold. So I was creeping closer to the fire, because it was getting colder and colder. This is New York. Hmm? And all of a sudden, I woke up, and it smelled a fire. What happened was my sleeping bag caught on fire. <laughs> And then it got so cold, I fell back to sleep. And as I was creeping closer to you, I smelled another fire. It caught on fire again. You know? <coughs> so it caught on fire about five times. <laughs> and when I returned, uh, the sleeping bag to B Billy Talbot, who was, we are no longer friends anymore. <laughs> that friendship came to a screeching halt, you know. But. It <laughs> <laughs> I say that because when, when I was far enough away, it kept me warm, but it got so close it actually burnt the sleeping bag. You know? 
So either the sacraments are going to warm us or they're going to burn us. We make sure we, that they warm us up, they don't burn us out, right? Okay, that being said, let's go through the steps of making a good sacramental confession, general confession. Okay, first of all, beg for the grace. St. Augustine says we're all beggars before God. Beg for the grace. Beg for the grace. Okay, tomorrow in my Mass, I'm going to be praying for all of you that you make the best confession in your, in your life. What did you say? Thank you, Father. It was kind of a subdued, anemic Thanksgiving. Thank you, Father. Somewhat subdued, somewhat quelled. No, okay. 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 Then you have you have to find you have to find this is a spiritual exercise. You have to you have to find a time and a place where this can be done well. Most of the people that go through this program spend I, I say in an average. Uh, four to five hours preparing for this. Eight hours. Patrick has done the exercises more than once. He said he spent eight hours. But it was worth it. It was hard work. It was worth it. Some of our people spend even more time. No? So you want to get, you, know, you, you want to make sure you give yourself, I would say, give yourself a whole morning. Or if you're working, or maybe the whole afternoon, well, if you're a night owl, give yourself, give yourself a good block of time. But it's got to be done with silence. Because if you've got phone calls and you've got a lot of noise and you've got pet Pete the parakeet that's uh, singing <laughs> a chime, okay, that's going to be that's going to be a source of, of, of distraction. That's right. Yeah. Hopefully, you don't have pet Pete the parakeet or the three Ps. Okay. Onomatopoeia. Right. Okay. <laughs> uh, you want to have that that block of time because God speaks in silence, and it's a good idea to pray uh, to pray with images. So I suggest three images: the crucifix, because we see that we sin our sins are responsible for the crucifixion of Christ. I think it's a good idea also to have an image of the Sacred Heart, which is a symbol of love, Divine Mercy, which is a symbol of mercy. God loves us. God is merciful. God died for us. And I think you should have an image of Mary. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. You know, we're not Jehovah Witnesses nor iconoclasts, are we? No. We believe in the proper use of images. Images, we're not, we're not adoring these images, but we love what they represent. They represent love, mercy, the tenderness of, of the heart of Mary, as well as our sins cause Jesus to be crucified. Amen? Amen. All right, uh, to warm up, pray the Hail Mary to Our Lady of Mercy. Then pray to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will give you a lot of light, light to be able to see your sins objectively. I say objectively because we can lie to ourselves. We can kind of justify, rationalize. Well, everyone else does that. Uh, the human person is very, very adept at lying to himself. We call it rationalization or intellectualization. But it's really lying. And then we're, we're going to give you a, a booklet so that you can read through it. It's an examination of conscious booklet. Now, given that there's, there's a lot of us, uh, I think Mary was calculating about 
170, 175. This is the smallest group, okay? Uh, so on Sunday, we got double the number. We got the, we got the house full, okay? We actually have four sessions. And up to now, we only have, a, we just have four of the priests. We're going to try to find another one to help us out. Um, so we're going to ask you to really prepare yourself well and confess the mortal sins. So the booklet has mortal sins and venial sins. If interiorly you're asking, what the heck is a mortal sin? Well, I'm, I'll respond to that that mental uh, questioning that you're possibly doing upstairs, okay? Okay, a, a, a mortal sin, there are th three conditions. We of the old school, we remember them. Yep. Right, D, right, Patrick, right, Mary? We, we remember it. But the younger generation, you probably never heard it before, even though it is in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And they are a grave matter, Grave matter means it, it's serious. The Protestants do not have a gradation, a differentiation. For them, everything is a sin. But we have a gradation. As John says, there is a sin that is unto death. There is a sin that's not unto death. You're reading the letter, the letter of St. John. So grave matter. Second would be full knowledge. You know it. And then the third would be full consent of the will. So those are three conditions of a mortal sin. Not that this is a course in catechesis, but it's a little bit of catechesis. I would try to memorize that. And if you've got children, teach them that. They should know that. Grave matter, full knowledge, full consent of the will. There you have mortal sin. An example. Is mass serious? Yes. yes. Is mass important? Yes. yes. Okay. So mass is very important. You know that. You purposely omit going to mass on Sunday. Mortal sin. Point blank. No doubt about it. That's a mortal sin. That's just one example. Okay. So you're going to be going through the booklet, and we also require that, that your confession, you have to write your general confession. It's got to be written. It's almost an, uh, an implicit, unstated rule of our program that if you don't have it written, you're not ready to make the confession. Right, Mary? Right. If you don't have it written, then you're not, you're not ready. Because it, what's going to happen is this. You don't have it written, you're going to forget something. You're probably going to forget the most important thing because you get nervous, no? Even with it written, you occasionally forget something. Right. Right. So, so write it out. Don't leave it on the counter there for your kids to see. <laughs> don't do that, no? It's not spiritual reading for the day. <laughs> Um, I've often written out confessions where I write in unknown symbols that I've created for myself, okay? Okay, so uh, you're going to write it out. So in the steps of making a general confession, there are five steps. The first is examination of conscience. That's what you're going to be doing with the help of the guide. Okay, second is sorrow. If you do not have sorrow or contrition, your confession, it's not a good confession. If it's just you're paying lip service, you're just expressing your sins with your lips, and it's not arriving at your heart, it's not good. So you have to go from your, your, your mind, your lips, to your heart. Contrition means you've got to be sorry. You've got to be sorry. 
Now there's two types of contrition. <coughs> and if you read through the older Baltimore Catechism, they have these words. It's called attrition and perfect contrition. You have a very puzzled look on your countenance, so I'll try to explain that to you. Thank you. Okay. Attrition, imperfect contrition is this. I'm sorry for these mortal sins because if I die in the state of mortal sin, I'm going to go to hell. It's related to one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit called fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, the Bible teaches us. So I don't want to be living with my boyfriend because I'm living in mortal sin. If we die, we're going to hell and we know that we deserve it. We know it. That's imperfect contrition. Fear of the Lord. That's, uh, it's, it's not the best, but it's enough for you to get absolution. And it's enough probably, for you, probably to get into purgatory. At least you got into purgatory. <laughs> you know, you know, maybe you're going to be there for a long time, but eventually you're going you're to get out. No? Face it, there are many levels of maturity in our spiritual life. The analogy I give is this. If you have children, some of you have children. Okay, when your little son was seven years old, maybe six, you recognize that he was old enough to make his bed. That you were no longer his indentured servant. Okay? Or his glorified bellhop. Okay? Rather, that he's old enough to make his bed by himself. So you said, Billy, you're going to make your bed today. And he said, no, I don't want to. You're seven years old. I shouldn't have to make your bed for you. Make it. No, I'm not going to make it. So you tell him to do it five times. He disobeys you. Your husband comes home, and you tell your husband, Billy was obstinate disobedient. So dad brings Billy into the next room, and he says, pull down your pants, and he hits a grand slam with Billy. That's a word which means he got a spanking. Next day when you say, Billy, make your bed. Yes, Mom. <laughs> Some of us are like that. We haven't arrived at a really strong love for God, but we have fear of the Lord that's good enough to get us into heaven. But we want to go beyond that. We want to go beyond that. Let, not living only, only through fear. Fear of the Lord, it's good. But it's not perfect. You want to arrive at a point where you're saying, you're praying to God, and you're saying, I'm not going to sin because I love God. You know why I love God? Because I know that He loves me. He loved me so much, God the Father, He sent His Son to be nailed to the cross for my salvation. He loves me so much, I don't want to hurt him anymore. That's perfect contrition. But it's a grace. you got to beg for it. It doesn't come naturally. you got to beg for it, and someone has to teach you about this. That's why I'm here. And the ideal is you want both of them. And if you say the act of contrition, the, the, the traditional act of contrition, you've got both of them in the act of contrition. Right, T? Right, Patrick? Yeah, the, the, old, the younger generation, you don't, probably don't know, the, the old traditional one, you've got those two elements, fear of the Lord and love for God. Okay, dry the loss of heaven, the pains, but, but most of all because my God, all good, and deserving of all of my love. There you have it. So in that classical, traditional one, you've got the two different elements, fear of the Lord and love of God.
We want to arrive at love of God. But usually fear of the Lord comes first. Like little, little, little belly had to be walloped. Okay? And eventually he's going to get up and he make his bed and give, give mommy a hug and say, Mommy, I made the bed because really I love you. It's hard to say he's going to be 19 and a half, but at least better late than never, right? <laughs> Maybe 20, okay? <laughs> better late than never. The late bloomer, right? Okay, the next step is, that's the second step. Examination of conscience, sorrow for sin, then you have a uh, firm purpose of amendment. Now, firm purpose of amendment means you're going to do all you possibly can to avoid sin, avoid the near occasion of sin. You have to do all you possibly can to avoid the near occasion of sin. He who plays with fire is going to get burnt. He walks on a slippery slope is going to fall. He who plays in danger will perish in danger, we read in the Old Testament. And he who walks on a slippery slope is going to, going to fall. So this step is firm purpose of amendment means you've got to rewind the film of your life. And this is very much related to self-knowledge, which is sometimes painful. You know, self-knowledge can be darn painful at times. Sometimes we don't want to look in the mirror of our soul because we don't want to see what, who we are, what we've done. Uh, Shakespeare and Macbeth, conscious, conscious does make cowards of all of us in a certain sense. We're afraid to, to look into our own conscience. See what we've done. So persons, places, or things that have led us into, into sin, well, we've got to break from that. So avoiding the near occasion of sin. So let me give an example. Okay, Juanito, great guy, but he's got his, he's got his kryptonite. Kryptonite, remember that is? His weak point. And it's drinking. He likes to drink. He's a great guy, but he likes to drink. So he had a problem with drinking for 20 years. So he makes a retreat, makes the exercises, and decides, i got to give up this drinking because I'm hurting my wife, I'm hurting my kids. The doctor already said you got problems with your liver. No. Uh, so he uh, makes a decision. He's going to give up drinking. But one problem is this. When he's by himself, he's not tempted. But when he goes with his beer buddies, oh boy. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, no? <laughs> Peer pressure, the beer buddies, it's Miller time, all that, okay? <laughs> mm. So as long as he avoids Miller time with his beer buddies, there's no problem. So it's Saturday night uh, after... after um, Saturday night after uh, Thanksgiving, which is kind of a tough time uh, when people are partying, and he, he has an inspiration, which is really a temptation. I think I'll just drive by to see where my friends are, just, just to wish them a you know, happy Thanksgiving. You know, I, I don't want to be antisocial. You know? Those antisocial people, they're pretty, they're pretty bad people. And we've got to be affable, amiable, kind, kind of be exuberant, extravagant. We have to do that. It's, it's, that's a, it's a charismatic gift that I have to manifest. No, here's all these words, okay? So he's driving by. There they are. There's about ten of them, and they're guzzling it down. Okay? It is Miller time. <laughs> they're going to time. They're going to town. I mean, they got these big muscles with this one, the six-pack, okay? <laughs> and he stops. He rolls down the window. He says, hey, Juanito. Hey, Juanito. Como esta? Echate uno no más. Any of you speak Spanish? Echate uno no más. You know what that means? No, come on, just, just, just one. Just a, no, 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 no. No, 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 I, I, I can't do it. Then one of them, he goes for the juggler vein, he says one word, 
that a Mexican hates. <laughs> the macho. You ready? Yeah. Mandy alone. <laughs> 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 okay, Mondi alone is a Mexican Spanish word means mama's boy. <laughs> so he gets out of the car and he he drinks a couple of six packs and he's reeling home. He's singing he's singing Christmas songs at the end of November. Okay? He did not avoid the near occasion of sin. He was playing with danger. And I can give you a lot of examples. Or another one, okay. Boyfriend, girlfriend, fiance, they're going to get married in, 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 about, uh, in about eight weeks. They really love each other, but they had, they're very passionate. So he says to, uh, to Lupe, hey, let's go out. It's Saturday. Let's go out to a restaurant. Uh, go out to one of those elegant Southern California restaurants, and I'll treat. Pollo Loco. Okay. <laughs> one of those elegant Southern California restaurants. You've heard of them before, right? Okay. So he takes her there and he's just he's just waxing eloquent. He's he's quoting Shakespeare and sonnets to her and I mean they're just, he's going to town. Right? And afterward he says, you know, I really love you. Let's Let's just uh, let's go to my condo. Just go to my condo. Let's pray the rosary together there. <laughs> By the, po- the time they arrive, they forget to bring their rosaries. Hmm? And they have premarital sex. They should have never gone to that condo. Generic occasion of sin. Should do, have two cars, have a luxurious meal at Pollo Loco, <laughs> maybe even go back for seconds, okay? <laughs> and after that, you go in your car, I go in my car, and I'll see you next Saturday. You know? Give her a, a nice little peck on the cheek. Bye. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's called avoiding the near occasion of sin. And there are tons of examples. You know you're weak when you go home and you're by yourself. Uh, the danger of looking at some bad stuff. No. Nope. On the internet. Well, there's no one at home. And I've fallen into this sin many, many times. Instead of going home, I'm going to go to church and I'll go to Mass. I'll make a holy hour. Then I'll go up and I'll, I'll play tennis with my friend. And when I come home, okay, my, my husband's going to be home, or my wife is going to be home, or my, my mother-in-law is going to be home, okay? I think this is one of the reasons why maybe some of us make confessions that are not really fruitful. Is we don't rewind the film of our life to see why we failed before. Come back and do the same thing over and over again. You say, it's been disco real, you know, the, the broken record con- confession, okay? And it's hard. It's hard to go back and see the shadows, the dirty spots in the interior castle, as Teresa of Avila calls it. Okay? But enough on that. Okay, we haven't even arrived at the confessional yet. Now we have. Step four. Okay, now you've arrived at the confessional. So on Friday and Saturday, we're going to be giving you a slot in which you're going to be signing up and, and you'll, well, hopefully we'll be able to get you in the confession as soon as possible. Uh, prepare to wait at least an hour, probably. Hmm? Uh, you pray your rosary. Examine your conscience. Renew your sorrow for your sins. Okay, before you enter the confessional, there's a, um, there's a number in the diary of St. Faustina Kowalska, where she goes to confession, then she comes out and she's not at peace. Which is pretty rare. Usually, 
Saint Faustine, as soon as you go to confession, she's just <coughs> overflowing with a lot of peace and joy. But this time, she didn't experience peace, and Jesus appeared to her, and she said, Jesus, why didn't I experience peace? He said, because you forgot to pray for the priest before you went in the confessional. Probably none of you have ever done that before. Try to do it. You're going to see your, your confession is probably going to be upgraded a bit. Do you know that I have a guardian angel? Did you know that? So do you. So both of them are working together in the confession. Are the angels present? Got power. I like that number. Okay, so that being said, you enter the confessional. Now, when you enter the confessional, make sure you close the door. <laughs> yes, Father. Mm. You might have an eavesdropper outside that's um, planted there to hear your dastardly deeds. Huh? You'd be surprised how many people leave the door open. I'm kind of shocked. Maybe because I'm a pragma pragmatic New Yorker. I mean, why, why would you leave the door open? Just close it. No? Then that person, when the person leaves, then he closes the door. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you leave, leave it open. Otherwise, they're going to think that someone's there, right? So I'll make sure. It's not the most important thing of the confession, but close the door, please. <laughs> then... Uh, Let's go through the mechanics of a good confession that you learned, you know, 60 years ago. Okay. Is that you enter, okay, you, 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 can, you can go behind the screen. Oh, hi. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can. Or you can go face to face. But it's a good idea to always start off with the sign of the cross. Then you say these words. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. My last confession was um, five weeks ago. Tell the, the, then, after that, my last confession was five weeks ago. This is the general confession of my whole life. These are my sins. Excellent. Now, why? The priest is a spiritual doctor. The priest is a spiritual doctor. I maybe mentioned one of the other talks. I, I one of my siblings, the older one, he's a um, orthopedic surgeon. Okay, he's a back he's a back surgeon. Now, if if you go to him. For the first time, he's going to say, "Well, when, when was the last time you've seen a doctor? Have you ever seen, have you ever seen a, a back doctor before?" You say, "No, this is the first time in my life." Or you say, "No, I went six and a half days ago." There's a huge difference, right? So we, as as not back surgeon, but but soul surgeons, the time element puts our mind into gear. And then, to confess well, once again, going to the diary of St. Faustina, St. Faustina says there are three essential qualities of making a good confession. They are transparency, humility, and obedience. You hear that? Okay, you weren't listening, so I'll repeat it. Okay, <laughs> transparency, humility, and obedience. Transparency means you ch you have to be clear. Okay? Ah, great! Here's a priest that just came from Vietnam. He doesn't know English, and I'm going to speak really fast. I remember when I arrived in Argentina from, from Italy. 
my Italian was very good, my English pretty good too, but my Spanish was really bad. I had a long line of people. I wonder why. <laughs> so you want to be transparent. Some of you uh, have heard of uh, Dragnet, the older generation. Remember Dragnet? Yes. Joe Friday? Just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts, ma'am. When you go to confession, just the sins, ma'am. Just the sins, ma'am. <laughs> so you don't want to be beating around the bush. And that's the next point, humility. Go to confession. You're confessing, you're, you're, you're confessing the sins of your husband. My husband, he's proud, he's obstinate, he's angry. I mean, is this your, your confession or your husband's confession? You say, well, Father, if you knew my husband, man, you would cut me a little bit of slack. <laughs> You really knew him, right? <laughs> that's not that's not humble, that's pride. That's pride. You're putting honey or marshmallow over, over cow dung. Yeah. You're like a nice graphic New York image, okay? The cow dung is, is the sin, no? You're making it saccharine sweet. Hmm? It's just important. You gotta be humble. And obedience, you have to obey the priest. Oh, I don't want to go to that priest because I don't want to do what he tells me to do. Eh? That's bad will. That's not good. You know, he's going to be telling you the truth. You don't want to obey the truth. There's something wrong there. So those are three conditions. Transparency, humility, and obedience. Give your penance, okay, I want you to say eight Hail Marys. How about four, Father? Oh, come on. <laughs> it should be double the number. My, my formator says whatever the priest gives you, always do, the, do double. When I was in, in, in formation, always do double. Because our sins probably merit much more than the penance that the priest that gives to us. Probably merits much more. Okay, then also in the context of your confession, you have to tell with respect to the mortal sins, you have to tell the number and the species of the mortal sins. Another analogy. A woman goes in to a hospital to have a an operation, she's got breast cancer. Okay, the doctor does the operation, which takes four hours. When she wakes up from the operation, after the anesthesia has worn off, what's the first question she's going to ask the doctor? <laughs> doctor, did the Dodgers win? No, that's not that important. <laughs> Nothing against the Dodgers, but you're going to be saying, Father, uh, Doctor, did you get it all, right? I think that's the first question. Did you get it all? Oh, you got about 30%. I'll see you next week. <gasps> you want to make sure that the doctor gets it all, otherwise they're going to come back. So when you go to confession, it's spiritual surgery. We want to get all of it out. We want to get all of it out. Nothing left except a clean, pure heart and soul. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Do you want to tell the, the, the number and the species of the mortal sins? Now, somebody might be thinking, well, you know, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm, getting, I'm getting close to 50 years old. How on earth am I going to remember all those sins? 
When I'm 25, how can I remember all the sins in my life? Okay, you may not be a very good mathematician, but the Holy Spirit is a darn good mathematician. The Holy Spirit, rely upon him. Don't forget. You may not remember, but if you pray, the Holy Spirit is going to hone in, and he's going to help you to get pretty darn close to the number. I believe the Holy Spirit is God. He's the truth. So this would be an example of an incomplete confession. Okay, a fiancé is about to get married, okay. Father, I mean, my last confession was a year ago. Uh, Miss Mass, premarital sex, and I, I purposely got drunk. Okay. Okay. Okay, the priest intervenes. Okay, you missed mass, premarital sex, you got drunk. That was just one time. Transform into co in, in, into a coyote. Woo! <laughs> mm -hmm. No. Many more. Okay, well, how many? Well, I missed mass, you know, it was once a month. Well, that's 12 times. Premarital sex? Yeah. Once a week? Yeah. How many, how many weeks in a year? 52 times. Drunk? Well, yeah, it was uh, every other weekend. Hey, about 26 times. See what I'm saying? If, if you don't say that, and I'm a stickler on that, I'm the sole surgeon. You don't, if you don't do that, I don't feel at peace. And for, for, for we as a priest, it's hard, it's hard work. But I'll do my part, you do your part. Okay? That's why I'm saying, try to prepare yourself for the love of God and to have mercy on the priest. Okay, I'll do my part, I'll give you absolution, and I'll try to get you out as soon as possible. You're, you're going to be totally forgiven. But you've got to do your part. Because, you know, the, the grace of the sacrament, the abundance of the grace, it really depends on you more than on me. I'll give you absolution. But if you're really well disposed, I spoke about the whole concept of dispositive grace. The better you're disposed, the more graces. Then in the sexual realm, you've got to, you've got to specify, okay, was it masturbation? Was it fornication? Was it adultery? Was it double adultery? Was it a homosexual act? Sorry, you got to specify. Because all of those that I mentioned, they're mortal sins, but some are more serious. Fornication is bad. But adultery is much worse. You know why? It's a sacrilege. The sacrilege, I mean, you, you promised to be faithful to your spouse. You broke your vows. You broke your promise. It's more serious. And if you're married, and it's double adult, you know what that is? You're a married woman, and you're cheating with a married man. <laughs> it's even worse. Say, for example, they both have four kids. How many people are damaged? Thomas Aquinas says, the more you damage charity, the more serious the sin is. You've damaged, you've damaged directly ten people. And a homosexual act is worse because it's against nature. So you have to be you have to be specific in that. Okay, so once you forget you once you have you've expressed your sins, and it, it may seem to be somewhat mechanical, but you can you can just read off the list. The preparation can take four, five, eight hours, and then you can just come in, just read off the list without without too much explanation. Actually, just, it might seem kind of be like a laundry list. That's okay, though. Just get it out. And just read it down. Get out the numbers. And now this is the, this is the real challenge. I can ask all of you to try to get it done within 10 minutes. So I'm going to think, we want 10 hours, Father, okay? <laughs> if Ignatius was given four to five days, why, would, why did you give us at least 10 hours? No. <laughs> The reason why is we don't have enough priests. I would love, I would love in the general confession to give each of you a half hour, but we don't have time. Right, Mary? We don't have time. 
uh, you're not aware of it, but there's a shortage of priests. So we got four of the priests here, maybe three. The, the, one of the priests is elderly and his health isn't that good. Uh, so we're going to ask you to, to try to get it done within 10 minutes. And my experience is, because I'm the one that wrote out this program, so I'm the one who has most experience for the past 11 years, those who confess quicker are those who are better prepared. Otherwise, you're running me ragged, and you're running ragged, too. Okay? So if you're well prepared, uh, you're well prepared, you just go right at it. And don't go off on tangents talking about peripheral or tangential things. No, Just cut to the quick, tell the sins as they are. All right, then. Uh, after, at the, uh, after you've finished, you say the act of contrition, hopefully you know it. Mm -hmm. Say whatever language you want. I mean, God is a polyglot. Mm -hmm. God knows languages pretty well. <laughs> and then the priest gives you absolution. You want to hear some beautiful words? And I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful words. But I did not give you general absolution. Uh -huh. <laughs> you thought I was giving you general absolution? Uh -uh. It's not the way it works, okay? Okay, so the priest gives you absolution. Beautiful words. All of your sins are forgiven. One more element, the fifth step. Uh, you got to carry out the penance. And I would suggest that you try, try to carry out the penance as soon as possible. Uh, if you can get it done right away, do it right away. Often when we're hearing confessions, we'll have the uh, Blessed Sacrament exposed either in the new church or the old church, so you can be praying in front of the Blessed Sacrament, which is beautiful. So I like to, uh, I, I like to, as I often do, I like to end with a story that I heard from Father Tim Gallagher talking about this topic. And this is a story to show us the, the really beautiful fruits or effects of a good confession, general confession. Ignatius says, you make a good confession that helps you to make better communions because your soul becomes all the more pure and clean. And there's nothing greater in the world than to receive our Lord in the Eucharist with a pure heart. This is the story. A 15-year-old girl was going through depression. So her mother decides to connect her with a professional psychologist. So she's seen the psychologist who is a non-believer but a good psychologist wants to wake for an hour. And uh, the girl is going, spending the time with this professional, unloading and talking about her problems. So months go by. Years go by. She's already 25. Ten years have passed. And she's thought about suicide several times because life is just insupportable. But something happens. One day, the psychologist wanders into a church in, her, in the city. The, the, the girl, now she's 25, 10 years have passed, is a, is a Catholic. So the, well, the psychologist enters into this church, and she sees a booth that kind of, kind of looks like a kiosk. We call it a confessional. She sees a man dressed in a black robe, yours truly, called a priest. And he sees that this little kiosk has the door open with a light on the top of the, that little booth there. So the man with the robe goes in, and then the, the young woman goes in after the man in the robe. 
And the psychologist is fascinated by this. Never seen anything like this before. Non believer. And she's waiting and looking. Three minutes pass, five minutes pass, eight minutes pass, ten minutes pass. And what happens now is a miracle, even though this psychologist never believed in miracles. The door is open, and the girl comes out, and she has this radiating smile. She's just radiating peace and joy. And the psychologist said, wow, what I tried to accomplish in 10 long years, I could not accomplish what happened in that little box in 10 minutes. Why? Psychology can help us get in touch with our emotions, but only Jesus Christ can heal the wounded hearts. And that's the purpose of confession. Jesus is the wounded healer. He's the wounded healer, and he's come to heal wounded hearts. All of us are wounded by original sin, by social sin, by personal sin. But Jesus Christ loves all of you, and he wants to give you his loving embrace so you can experience the word shalom. Peace be with you. Amen? Amen. And God bless all of you, and I'll be praying for you. Thank you, Father.